This is for the ethics review class at Parker University. For this video, I want to talk a little bit about contracts with employees. Now, I'm going to talk about this from the perspective both of a business owner and the perspective of an employee, because I suspect that many of you listening to this may serve in both roles as an employee and an employer over the time of your career as a chiropractor. Quick thought about verbal contracts. Remember Samuel Goldwyn's advice, a verbal contract isn't worth the paper it's written on? A lot of people have heard that advice and they've jumped to the conclusion that that means a verbal contract is unenforceable. In fact, in most cases, with a few exceptions, verbal contracts can be enforced. It's more difficult because the parties usually have different memories about exactly what the promises were and whether they were promises or just general discussions. Uh, so it's important, I think, to reduce contracts to writing because it helps clarify exactly what the terms of the agreement are and everybody understands exactly what's occurring. So whenever you offer someone a job, you should do it or follow, you should do it uh, uh, preferably in person or over the telephone, but you should also follow it up with a quick letter. It doesn't need to be a lengthy letter, but three or four paragraphs. Uh, offering them the position, telling them exactly what they're going to be paid, where they're supposed to work, uh, and looking, tell, spelling out or reminding them that it's an at-will relationship. Even though you may hope for a long-term relationship or employment, uh, it may or may not be. And, and either the clinic or the employee has the right to change their mind and, and terminate the employment relationship. So what are some of the things you should look for in connection with contract? Uh, first thing, like I mentioned already, is to remember a written contract is not required. Certainly it's the best practice, but it's not always going to be required for to have an enforceable contract. There are a few cases, now I don't think they're very good court opinions, but there are a few court opinions out there where the judges held that offering an employee a job, uh, offering them a salary for one year, had the effect of creating a one-year employment agreement. So promising to pay somebody $40,000 a year to work in your office means that you're now committed to employing them for one year. Easy way to avoid that issue is to simply offer the salary based on a monthly salary. Uh, that way, at worst possible case, you're only out for a one-month salary. The contract should spell out the duties. Uh, what, is, what is the job of the employee? Is it a full-time job or a part-time job? Is the employee allowed to have other jobs? Or is the employee expected to be fully committed only to this job? Um, I think it's a good practice for the contracts to spell out exactly what the job duties are. Often I recommend attaching a job description. Uh, different people, if you just use titles like chiropractic assistant or receptionist or associate chiropractor, different people in different clinics may interpret those jobs differently. And, and the problem is if the associate doctor, for example, is coming into your practice with the expectation that when they get the job, their job will be to show up at the office, treat patients, and go home. Whereas the business owner may have the perspective that the associate doctor should be uh, going out on marketing, uh, going out for spinal screenings, going out for other public events to help recruit and bring patients into the practice in addition to being there in the office to treat patients. Um, or they may think the doctor should have a, a, some administrative duties uh, like supervising other employees or helping with the insurance billing uh, that the associate doctor may not be thinking about. So think about before, you know, again, before you start the interview process or even advertise for a job, you need to have a job description in place that needs to be reflected in the contract. How long does the agreement last? Is it a month to month? Is it a year to year? Is it a two year, three year, five year contract? Uh, and the curious thing I've noticed in employment agreements, especially among chiropractors, is they often have a lengthy term of employment, something like three to five years. But then you go to the next paragraph where it talks about grounds for termination, 
and it provides that the employer can terminate at any time with or without cause. That's not a contract for a number of years. That's an at-will employment relationship. And look, if you're offering somebody an at-will employment relationship, be honest about it and make it clear that that's what it is. If it is actually a contract for a period of time, the grounds for termination should be limited to good cause. Uh, good cause should be defined, or at least there should be some examples of what is good cause. And depending on the nature of the good cause, it may be appropriate to give the employee uh, notice of the violation and an opportunity to cure the problem. So for example, if the employee is required to carry malpractice insurance and the employee has allowed their insurance to lapse or is in danger of lapsing, uh, instead of terminating the employee, it may be more appropriate to give the employee an opportunity to bring the premiums current rather than an immediate termination. Uh, compensation. Of course, this is the clause everybody goes to immediately. How much am I going to be paid? Uh, spell it out. If there's any kind of bonus system or any kind of uh, 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 you know calculation based on production or bonus based on production, that should be spelled out as clearly as possible in the agreement. Uh, I've seen some people come up with some pretty convoluted bonus systems or compensation systems, and I think that's a mistake. I think you're better off keeping it fairly simple so people can understand it. If you're trying to reward specific conduct, make sure they can understand what that conduct is and be aware or, or know when they're going to be rewarded for it. Covenants not to compete. Uh, generally, the, the idea of a covenant not to compete is the business owner has a business that consists or a big part of the value of that business is the patient base, the relationship with the patients. And they want to protect that relationship with the patients when the employment ends. And they want to prevent the employee from being able to take those patients or to start a new practice or go to work in a new practice where they may be likely to take those patients away or may be able to, to attract those patients. So certainly during the employment, there is a covenant not to compete. Whether it's in the agreement or not, the employee has a fiduciary duty to the employee uh, or the employer. The worker cannot be taking customers or patients to their own business and taking them away from the business owner's business. Uh, that's simply a violation, whether it's spelled out in the contract or not. But even after the end of employment, it is possible if the employer or the business owner has written into the contract a good covenant not to compete, they can prohibit the employee, whether they quit or are terminated, they can prevent the former employee from competing within a reasonable time, reasonable territory, and reasonable scope of activity. Now, I've seen a number of these clauses. I've seen some of them that are written very well and probably would be enforced. But I've also seen a lot of them where the employer gets carried away and tries to protect too long and too big of an area. And that's a mistake. Uh, think carefully uh, about making it reasonable. Uh, and this is probably a good time to consult with an attorney to make sure the covenant not to compete is drafted properly and implemented appropriately. It makes it more likely you're going to be able to enforce it with less expense. On the other hand, if it's written poorly, it may be very difficult or impossible to enforce it. Now, these clauses may also prohibit patient solicitation. Sometimes that clause may simply say the former employee is prohibited from trying to contact patients. In that case, if the patient were to contact the former employee, it wouldn't be a violation for the former employee to talk to them. On the other hand, these clauses sometimes go beyond that and say not only is the former employee prohibited from contacting uh, patients of the clinic, but the former employee is also prohibited from treating or working for those patients. Uh, employee rating. Uh, again, part of the value of a business is often the employees that work in that business, and it is often a clause, th these contracts often include a clause 
that prohibits the former employee from hiring other employees away from the business. Now, liquidated damages clauses, this is another area where I see people get carried away and try to exaggerate how much it would damage their practice. Uh, essentially, liquidated damages is a agreement that if there's a violation of the clause, we think this is a reasonable prediction of what the damages would be. So for example, if there's a patient solicitation clause, there may be a liquidated damages that say every patient who is contacted, there will be damages. We agree the damages will be $5,000 per patient. Now, the reality is that's an excessive amount. That's not going to be enforced by a court. But if it's a reasonable prediction of what the real damages may be, if the profit earned over the course of treating a patient on an average patient in a clinic is about $1,000, then a liquidated damages clause that says, if you take away one of my patients, you're going to pay me $1,000, that clause is probably going to be enforceable. And the benefit of those clauses is they make it very easy to calculate the damages without having to bring in expert witnesses. The other thing about a covenant not to compete that you need to understand is they can be enforced through a temporary restraining order. That means the business owner can go get a court order that bans or prohibits the employee, former employee, from opening a practice in a particular area or from working for a practice in a particular area. And that can be a very expensive process. And if the fees are shifted to the former employee, that can be very destructive. Uh, so these are these covenants can be a very helpful tool if they're used appropriately and fairly. On the other hand, if they're used as a, a uh, hammer, uh, they're not going to be enforced by the courts. And in fact, the employer runs the risk of creating a very poor impression if they try to enforce them. Uh, Contract may include provisions on vacation and holidays. Like I mentioned in the last video, there is no law that requires a private business to offer paid vacation or paid holidays. They may offer it, but it's not required. Uh, malpractice insurance. Uh, ordinarily, if I'm advising a business owner, I recommend that they provide the malpractice insurance. That way they have control over the payment of the premiums. They have control of the policy limits. They, they, they have absolute knowledge of what's going on and absolute control over what's going on with that insurance policy. But for some reason in the chiropractic profession, I've seen a number of employment agreements that require that the employee, the worker, provide their own malpractice insurance. Now, malpractice insurance for chiropractors is cheap enough that that's not a huge burden. But I think it's a little bit unusual. But if that's part of the requirement as the employee, you need to be aware of it and be prepared to pay that expense and to keep the policy current. Uh, confidentiality clauses are appropriate, not always included in the employment contract, but sometimes. Uh, usually the confidentiality clause covers patient information it may cover other business information. So if the business is using trade secrets, that is information that's not readily available to the public, they can protect that information. A good example of a trade secret is something like a list of the patients with their addresses and phone numbers. That contract will probably also include some boilerplate clauses, some typical clauses you find in a, a, a contracts. Uh, usually the contract will provide it's not assignable by the employee. Obviously, if someone hires John Doe, they expect John Doe to show up for work. But it may often be assignable by the employer. So if the business owner sells the business or brings in a new supervising doctor, uh, that's not something the employee can control. Arbitration clauses seem to be appearing more and more frequently in employment agreements as well as all kinds of other consumer agreements. Arbitration is essentially an agreement that says instead of going through the public court system, if we have a dispute, we're going to hire a private judge, an arbitrator, and let that private judge resolve our dispute privately. Now, the reason for arbitration is, number one, it's private instead of public. Uh, number two, it can be quicker 
than a, a, a trial. Uh, number three, arbitration usually does not have any kind of appeal. So once the arbitrator makes a decision, it's done. Uh, those kinds of arbitration clauses are enforceable, even if the claim is based on discrimination. There are some court opinions that say if the arbitration clause is, is drafted appropriately, it can be enforced, which means the employee does not have the option of going to a court. It means the employee will never have an option to present their claim to a jury, and that can be a disadvantage to you. Uh, but just be aware if that clause is there, it's probably not going to be a negotiable clause and it's probably, it does affect your rights. That venue clause just says, here's the court uh, where we will resolve our disputes. One of the mistakes I see people make regularly is they copy somebody else's contract. So if a, a chiropractor in Dallas chooses to copy a uh, contract from a doctor in San Antonio, You'll find in those venue clauses, it'll say instead of saying the venue or the court where we'll decide is Dallas County, it'll say the court is Bear County. Pay attention to those clauses and make sure it's got the right county in it. Severability clause generally says if any part of the agreement is unenforceable or illegal, we're going to sever out that piece of the agreement. Everything else will be enforceable. The entire agreement clause says everything is in the written document. There are no promises, no warranties, nothing outside of the written contract. Pay attention. Sometimes business owners will try to recruit somebody by making all kinds of promises about the way their career will advance, about the number of patients they will have versus the number of patients they will need to recruit, about the bonus structure, how often bonuses are paid, how bonuses are calculated, as a worker, you should understand that unless those promises are reduced to writing, this entire agreement clause has the effect of making all those oral promises unenforceable and meaningless. So make sure you get those promises. If they're important to you, make sure you get those promises in writing. Just a couple of quick resources that are available. Uh, this book by uh, Physician Employment Contract Handbook has some good examples in it. Uh, the AMA, now I know most of you as chiropractors don't like the AMA, but the AMA does have some publications that are useful, and one of the publications they have is called the Annotated Model Physician Employment Agreement. If you don't have any kind of written contract in place and you're starting with a blank page, this is a good place to start. Uh, the Physician Employment Agreement uh, goes through the critical clauses. It includes some clauses that are appropriate for doctors and doctor's offices. And usually it doesn't just include one clause. It will include two or three different clauses. Perhaps one clause that's most favorable to the business owner, one clause that's kind of neutral, and one clause that's most favorable to the worker. And that helps you design your contract in a way that's fairer uh, to your workers and to the business owner, it provides better protection. Uh, now, the AMA used to have it available on their website. I think they've now got it hidden behind a firewall so that you may have to purchase that. Uh, I've not looked at the purchase price. It may or may not be something reasonable that you want to look at, but it gives you a good starting point for these kinds of contracts. Uh, and of course, there's all kinds of other publications available out there about drafting employment contracts. I recommend you try to find one that's specific to physician employment contracts. That'll help you avoid problems with paying kickbacks or Stark Law violations and help you include provisions about patient confidentiality that are more appropriate to that specific type of contract.